implications of cost and transparency. So big data and the implications for cost and transparency. And I'm joined here by two very distinguished guests, Dr. David Newman and Dr. Juve Reinhardt. And what we thought we would do is, I'll ask a couple of questions first, they'll answer, and then what we will do is open it up for questions from the audience. So we'll split it about 50-50. So the, the um, first question we wanted to talk about is, well, what do we hope to gain by transparency uh, in healthcare? Is it better outcomes? What's, what's, the, what's the objective here? Dr. Reiner? Yeah, before I go into this, so my <laughs> wife isn't here, and all these cookies, so I got a cookie. <laughs> and Christy tells me it's captured already by big data. <laughs> and she's probably seeing it right now on her iPhone. And what I'm a, never shopping in Syracuse, <laughs> wasn't that the city where? <laughs> what a horrible, uh, sorry, I won't eat it. Uh, well, what I think, when you look at our enterprise, we want people to live healthier, longer lives. That's where we start. And part of that is we want people to manage their own health better because the health production, the way we teach it in health economics, it's a production process presided over by the individual with management consulting services from the healthcare system and plumbing. But by and large, the person is in charge. So health and big data can certainly, as we heard, uh, help individuals managing better health. Uh, but using the health system intelligently is part of that because that is part of health management. Now, close your eyes and imagine Macy's, Quaker Bridge Mall or someone, and I stand in front, blindfold all the patients, shove them into Macy's and say, shop effectively cost effectively for a shirt. And you come out with shorts with parts on it and stuff. And, and then, you, so you, you look at this, it's so well, nice shorts, but I actually wanted a shirt. And then sort of three months later, you get a bill in Greek, incomprehensible, codes, this, that, lots of numbers. And there's a little box in English, pay this amount. <laughs> this, imagine if we bought shirts this way, but that is how Americans have bought healthcare. Okay. And what we're saying is, well, you can either have it like the Europeans, take price out of the equation, but they still have a quality problem. In Canada, you would want to know which is the hospital where your probability of survival is higher than another, or the uh, same for uh, a physician. So the quality data you would need so it seems to me being pretty obvious why we would want to do this. In this country, we want to engage the patient economically, whether that's an ideological decision we made by default, but we're making it. And if you want me to be a prudent shopper who has skin in the game, financial skin in the game, I need to know the price uh, for me to be an efficient shopper. Also to discipline the providers. Uh, so I think there are lots of reasons why we would want. The final, actually, I would add is there's also professional rivalry. Even if patients don't use the information, people look at each other and say, why are we so expensive? There's pride in this. We saw that in Pennsylvania with the, with the heart surgery. Patients don't actually use the information on who's a good and bad doctor. The, the, even the cardiologists that don't. But they look at each other and say, why, I have, why, why is my mortality rate higher? So that's another benefit outside the patient. But that would be my answer. And, and I basically agree in the sense that um, as economists, we assume that a properly functioning market requires information flows. And one of the key pieces of information you want out there is, is, is price, and you want some sense of, of quality. Um, to, and I, I should just digress for a moment and indicate that I'm speaking on behalf of myself and not the Healthcare Cost Institute. I've got uh, John Gruber on the left on my board, and I've got Steve Parente, who was a McCain advisor on the right, uh, and the board does not take uh, any position, nor does the institute advocate anything other than 
than more data. So uh, I, I am speaking solely for myself. The board doesn't agree on anything. Um, <laughs> um, um, and just one more, one more thing, um, and that is um, we hold just, and, and Christy will get into it, we, we hold data on about 40% of you in the room. Uh, we hold all of the administrative claims data for Aetna, Humana, and United, and we have access to the Kaiser Permanente data um, for public reporting and, re and academic research purposes, only non no commercial, no proprietary research. Uh, and we've been dragged into the price transparency space. It wasn't one of our original missions uh, because we have the actual allowed amounts paid. We have the coinsurance, the copays, the deductibles, and the amounts actually paid to providers with some, some exceptions. So since we hold the data, we're, 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 we're in the space. Um, at the same time that we, we know that price transparency and, and quality transparency are important to a, a, a properly functioning market, and, and Julie, wherever you are, you will have know more about this than me, we also have some concerns about what, how that information is used, its potential to be used for anti-competitive purposes, um, I suggest most people go out and take a peek at the Congressional Budget Office 2008 study that looks at markets similar to healthcare, where there's a concern that in concentrated markets, price transparency narrows the variance in prices and raises the average. So I guess personally my concern is that a lot of the formative research, and we'll return to this question throughout, has not been done with respect to price transparency. What information consumers want, how they use it, how we should display it, how we should provide it, who should have access to it, for whose purpose are we generating it, or is it consumers, providers, government, uh, payers? These are all different aspects of transparency. Um, and finally, to finish my sort of role as Eeyore out of Winnie the Pooh with the cloud over my head. Um, it's also the case that when we talk about quality, um, some of the quality indicators actually, even in regulated markets like Medicare, uh, allow providers to uh, essentially create monopolistic pricing power. Um, and I have a good story that I'll tell people about that later, but basically the high quality providers, we don't know when you put five stars next to their name, uh, what they're going to do with respect to price. And we don't know how consumers are prepared to trade off a five star knee surgeon for a four star knee surgeon and how big that price differential should be. Uh, and at what, at what point we advocate to somebody that you really only need a three star knee surgeon. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, how consumers are actually going to use that information. So until a lot of that formative research is done, um, I'll put prices out there, guys. Uh, I, I already told Horizon that was in the audience, you know, you, you give me your data and we'll do New Jersey pricing. Um, but uh, I think there's some formative research that also has to go hand in hand with the price and quality uh, movement. I think this latter point, by the way, uh, we went into consumer directed healthcare and market driven healthcare and never engaged the psychologists who I believe should really be driving this discussion because I have colleagues here, former colleague, won a Nobel laureate in economics, although a psychologist, because he pointed out to economists that we were naive in thinking about <laughs> how, uh, how consumers choose. Then we have Elder Shafir who gives wonderful lectures. And I attend them just to learn a little bit. Apparently, if you give people more than five choices, they become paralyzed uh, yeah. by that. And yet, you know, we take pride. I heard somebody take pride on an exchange that they had 90 different products on there. And you already know that'll be paralysis. So we economists have a lot to learn from other disciplines on how people use the data. So we, don't have, we haven't figured this out, but we will. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, you mentioned that you have a lot of data on, on New Jersey, and how has transparency been working? You know, what can we learn from other states and, or other countries? Well, I, I, I think Joe was the, the better speaker to that, um, I, I, and I, I, we, we agree on a lot, we disagree on some. Um, basically, and I'll, I'll take it out of the states, there's a couple of states, eight, ten, that have operating all pair claims data sets. Um, the um, state initiative group within SOSIO, the, the innovation center at CMS, 
issued 12 or 13 uh, rate review and price transparency grants. Unfortunately, as I met with the uh, Cycle 3 grant administrator, uh, they issued grants with no standardization across the state efforts. So you've got basically 13 states potentially doing 13 very different things. One of the problems that I, I sense from the APCD movement in general is that there's not enough standardization. Elliot Fisher, I, as I'm told, tried to do a study across Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont and needed a contractor to standardize the data sets across three states. So these are expensive, relatively expensive. We heard from, from New York today that it's $60 million uh, to introduce a project. In Maine, they're spending about one, one and a half dollars per citizen each year in the initial couple of years. Um, that doesn't include the costs of the insurers to provide the data. And claims data really isn't a good tool for price transparency. Um, it depends how you want to do it, but um, basically if you want timely data, uh, we pull data six months after the close of the calendar year, and we still have to com actuarially complete open claims. You'll have 100% of the pharmacy claims paid because they're paid almost instantaneously. But if you want to do current prices on a 30-day-old 30, you know, 30 prices you, and you're looking to the claims, the problem with that is the claims are open. They're not adjudicated. They're not paid. And I think where Uwe and I would actually completely agree is you can't do price transparency on codes. You can't be no. thinking right. about having 15,000 procedure codes, 50,000 ICD-10 uh, codes, uh, and expect consum consumers consume health. They want to be made well. They want to know the price of what they're I'm going to the doctor, I don't know what he's going to do or she's going to do for me, but I want to know what's going, what the, price, the cost is going to be. And unless we change the entire payment scheme so that a visit is a visit no matter what you consume, consu transparency doesn't mean anything. It's going to be very, very difficult. And we, we have enough trouble right now in the exchanges just telling consumers who's in their network. But imagine the situation where you have a provider with 30 different contracts, with 30 different prices, 15,000 different procedure codes, and I've listened into CMS call center calls where grandma calls up and says, I want to know about my coverage, and the call center operator says, well, who are you, who's your insurer? And they say, AARP. No, who's your insurer? Oh, Medicare. No, who's your insurer? You're in Medicare Part C. You have a commercial insurance company, and they don't know. So how many of you know whether you're in the PPO product, the HMO product, you, and all of these have different prices, and it becomes impossible for consumers to make sense out of that? Well, when you look at the actual experience, I love the way Farsat did this to say we deify people and then crap on <laughs> yes, them. Crap you know, and, and so I could just imagine when the Wright brothers took off with the plane and I said, oh yeah, it flies, but they don't serve any meal on Because <laughs> <laughs> we always have these big expectations. I think a lot of progress has been made. I mean, even when you think back, in 83 we introduced the DRGs. That was a very awesome thing to do because overnight, hospitals that didn't even have an accounting system had to have a cost accounting system where they could track cost by DRG and compare what they got with what it cost them. And that was done silently. So when people say we haven't progressed, even in IT, we have. There's been a lot of, when you look at a modern hospital, what they know, what they can do, it's not bad. Uh, you can probably do order entry by doctor right. and so on. So this isn't bad, but it isn't totally uh, there yet. Uh, <clears throat> part of it, I think, has to do, there's a quality piece. The quality piece uh, is somewhat slow because the science of developing the metric is still in its infancy. A lot of progress, thousands of people around the world are working on this, and progress has been made, but uh, uh, to control for all the variables that affect outcome. People always say, ah, oh, process, that's not the right quality metrics, you have to have outcome. But if you were to ask, rate my teaching by what my students know, I would certainly want to have control. Who are they, did they study, uh, and so <laughs> you know, uh, did they uh, binge drink? 
I need to know, of course we know all that, but uh, uh, you know, you'd want to have that in the equation. So the metrics on the quality, but to say we haven't made progress is ridiculous. There's a lot of quality metrics uh, that we already have. On the price, uh, why haven't we done better? The problem you raised is in fact the one. I once accidentally downloaded the charge master of the California master charge master. And it turns out, I don't know why, I know how to print on the computer, <laughs> but I don't know how to stop it. <laughs> so, it just this happened. really happens. <laughs> a ream of paper. It was this thick. Then I counted them. There were 19,338 codes in the charge master. Yours probably has five less, but uh, <laughs> that isn't helpful. And when you look at how they're described, you can't use this. Physicians have, what, 9,000 codes? 15,000. 15,000, now. It's grown. So, <laughs> I mean, my proposal had been to say, let every hospital use DRGs for everyone. Then you have a relative value scale, and all you have to tell me is your money price for the base unit, say, appendectomy. And you do the same for the physician. You have a relative value scale, 15,000 items, I don't care. Price out your base unit, and I know every other price is appropriately higher. That, however, can work only when you have an all-payer system. Because when you have a hospital that has a lot of Medicaid and uninsured, and another one doesn't, and then if you ask what do they charge private payers, partly the price is different mainly to recoup what they don't go through the uninsured. So we have a mess. Those are the barriers. Of course, putting doctors and hospitals into statistical fish bowls is always uh, sort of swimming in the nude in these bowls. <laughs> I mean, you, who likes that? What an image. Uh, but uh, <laughs> there is resistance on that account. But I think the, the real technical barriers to having more progress should not be underestimated. And we geeks have to actually work more on this. And I tell my students, you guys have to fix this. I'm tired. But uh, you, know, <laughs> you guys will fix it. And I have that faith. Somehow we will ultimately get price information. We participate as a collaborator with the state of Vermont. We hold all of their commercial claims data from their APCD. Um, and they have a monthly call the other day. And while well, I didn't participate in it, the office, other people in the office did. But what came up there was actually to pay by DRG. They, as they begin to design their, their single payer system, the notion was to simplify these prices exactly as Uwe suggests. You go ahead. You know, the reason I was looking at my, I, I just got from Catalyst for Payment Reform, great organization on the West Coast, Suzanne Del Banco runs right. it. Right. Was it Lee Pro? Uh, Lee Pro, it's a dynamite lady. Mm -hmm. But they have a, a seminar coming up, webinar, what is keeping price transparency from becoming a, a reality? reality. <laughs> so you can listen in May 20th, 11 to 3 p.m. It's free. We can sell uh, her our video. Is yeah. This <laughs> <laughs> so it fits right in here. Well, there are a lot of efforts that are underway, an awful yeah. lot of efforts yeah. underway. Are there any of them that are really cutting edge? Things that are, you know, efforts that are uh, something we should all be looking at and watching and staying abreast of. Yeah, I could take a one. Which one? Well, there was uh, a, an experiment by CalPERS with WellPoint and Castlight. Castlight is a, a computer startup that just went IPO, uh, incidentally. And they uh, looked at hospital prices for hip replacements and knee replacements and found unbelievable variations. Factor of what, six or something in California. And then they look, they also have quality data. And the Castlight company gets those numbers from the employers, so they're objective data. Actual prices, not charges, and some outcome data. And they did deals with some centers of excellence who would do this for 30,000 apiece. And I told the employees, you can go to these hospitals and have that done, and we'll cover it. If you go to one that charges 50,000, you pay the 20 out of your own pocket. 
That is cutting edge. Yeah. That really is cutting edge. Mm -hmm. Now, this can be misused. You could, of course, send them all to hospitals that kill people. But they actually paid attention to quality mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in this case. So uh, those of us who do health policy would have to make sure that they're quality metrics. But I believe that's a way to, to introduce the market into healthcare that isn't rationing by healthcare ability to pay if you pay attention to quality, but rather disciplining the outliers. You know? But again, there you have to be careful. You don't punish people who charge a lot because they have a lot of uninsured. That's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a mm -hmm. thing. And, and reference pricing has the advantage that it takes away the power, potentially the power of a market price setter in a particular market. Yeah. So what you're doing is you're putting out there an average price, however we want to define it, average plus 10%, whatever needs to clear the market in terms of providing enough supply relative to the quality. Uh, and you don't have a price setter out there, simply the, the, the five-star surgeon <laughs> setting their price and everyone falling in line like a, a happy chain of ducks or ducklings behind setting prices, what should be the four star price, the four and a half star price. So we're at, and it's from a reporting perspective, also a lot simpler. Uh, it does shift some burden because now the consumer has to be empowered to go when they're not working with a insurer. And the concern really should be for the uninsured who remain under the ACA and folks in the high deductible health plans who are actually paying prices. But these people now all of a sudden have a reference price when they go out to shop and they need a knee replacement and their first stop says uh, $95,000 and the reference price is $28,000, they're either empowered to ask why to begin to negotiate or move to the next surgeon. And on the, on the state, state, what can state governments do? This catalyst uh, for payment reform graded the states 44 got Fs in terms of transparency, 44 states. But if you wanted cutting edge, I would say Oregon was early, but it's fairly, to my mind, uh, not advanced. Massachusetts is the one that I'd keep an eye on. A, because they have this cost reform. Stu Altman is chair of that. <clears throat> they publish very good comparative cost data and price data on the various uh, hospitals. And in Massachusetts, Blue Cross, has what I consider also a cutting a edge payment system. It's basically global budgets to, uh, <clears throat> to big medical groups, Lee, uh, what is it, not Lehigh Clinic, something, cl uh, great clinics of, of physicians who get a budget updated by inflation, but if they have superior quality, they get 10% of more. A bonus. And a bonus, and if they're very more efficient, they get to keep the change. I think the Massachusetts payment system is cutting edge, and we'll see what Maryland will do with the waiver they negotiated with Medicare. It's brand new. Uh, it's really like Wright Brothers. This may be a plane that won't take off, but <laughs> I, if anyone can do it, Maryland could. So a lot of interesting stuff is actually happening. And, and the only problem at the state level is that each state is doing something slightly different. So if you want to build out from a big data set a comprehensive unified data set, these state efforts are, are are problematic. So while New York described itself as liberating the data, it in fact has created now a New York silo. And his response this morning, if he's still here, was basically, now we should be adopting national standards. And really what people mean at the state level in adopting national standards is adopt my standards so I don't incur any costs associated <laughs> with adopting your standards. And, and that is really problematic. You need the standards up front or you need somebody to impose structure and order. Otherwise, the, the data come in under a whole variety of different contracts. All of them are working with commercial contractors. Every contractor wants to sell the latest, newest model of Ferrari. And the way they sell it is by, by telling you what the other states did poorly, all right? And why their method and their approach is uniquely better than what other states are doing. Uh, and that's not a model for building big data across states. But this uh, actually is uh, uh, an American malaise, in my, <laughs> in my view. I always hear this, one size doesn't fit all. And I always ask innocently, 
Do Tennessee people have three kidneys and Massachusetts one? <laughs> How, why would, this is the country of McDonald's, of Holiday Inn, of the Marriott chain, Macy's, where everything is the same. No country, I'm telling you, having lived in others, is as homogeneous as the United States. You can tra travel across, you wake up in a town, you wouldn't have a clue in, my, in, my, in Arkansas or Indiana. It's all the same. You know, I mean, in, at least in Canada, there's Quebec. Hey, they speak different. You know? <laughs> try that in Germany. You know, even the rooftops look different. Everything is the same here, but somehow we are told one data system couldn't fit all states, which is the most absurd. So next time when you're at a cocktail party and somebody says that, spit in their beer. This <laughs> simply cannot be true. Uh, I don't know where this ever came from. I don't know why we accept this statement, uh, one size, that you're right. What would this take? This would take the federal government, President Obama, putting out maybe another 10 billion and saying we're going to pay for making this mesh right like the, he did for the meaningful use. Mm -hmm. And I think it could be done, and I hope maybe before he retires, <laughs> uh, he could be persuaded to the, to the one last hurrah, uh, you know, atone for the exchanges by doing that. <laughs> so that we, well, we, we would uh, have this, because it's certainly true, uh, uh, New York is very proud of what it has done, uh, but I can just see Tennessee taking New York's thing without some back and forth. I, I don't hold out any hope. Uh, are any CMS folks, HHS folks still in the room? Or? Oh, basically, they really support big data. Instead of building out one data enclave, they've decided to build out 13 data enclaves within the same organization. So you know, when you think about the cost, you th think about the silos, yeah. even yeah. one yeah. federal agency yeah. under, there's one contract alone uh, let that envisions 10 data enclaves. There was originally another data enclave hold, asking to hold it, almost the identical data for fraud uh, 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 purposes. Niall Brennan, for those who know Niall in the room, Niall built out his own data enclave. So you know, everyone wants to have an enclave, and you know, unlike universities, you don't get to put your name perpetually on it. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it's they're, they're not rationally using the resources even that they have. So um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that they're going to be the solution. Before we open it for questions, I happened to look over your way when Farzad was speaking, and you raised your hand with the definition for big data. And I think oh, he was uh, going to return. Yeah. All, all to I meant it. is I have big data. Uh, <laughs> um, we, 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 we hold, I don't remember what I said earlier, we, we hold administrative claims data for over 50 million Americans. We hold uh, it in all 50 states, the District of Columbia. We hold. Um, we actually hold 40% of the Medicare Advantage data, and under our recently announced re academic research partnership program, MedPAC, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, is licensing our data because they can't get Medicare Advantage data out of CMS. So um, to, to put it in perspective, um, we hold all of the employer-sponsored insurance, as I said, for three or four of the major insurers. Toward the end of the year, we have begun the process of becoming a qualified entity under the uh, Affordable Care Act, which will allow us to hold all of the Medicare A, B, and I think 40% of the D data. Wow. So we'll be up above 100 million insureds. Uh, we have begun, actually not, be, we've made, we're, we're now working on standards with the Defense Department to get uh, data out of TRICARE on 5 million insureds covered under TRICARE. Um, and we're in talks, for all of you who are concerned about the aggregation of data in one location, uh, we're now in talks to bring EMRs into our data holdings. Uh, one entity has offered us EMRs for about 35 million Americans, and we're in talks with another holder of Sizable. And when you begin to merge uh, and match the um, EMRs to the administrative claims data, we would probably have a match somewhere around 7.5 million people where we would have comprehensive looks to allow us to do both comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness, uh, that which was banned under the Bush administration, uh, cost effectiveness studies with respect to health care. Um, so that's, we, we live in it, it's, um, it's, as I'm fond of saying, big data isn't cheap data, it's not easy to work with, um, but, and, and, and we're 
licensing, as I said, to academic researchers. Um, Harlan, can I say? Uh, Har Harlan, um, uh, Minnesota, Michigan, um, uh, Yale, Dartmouth, University of Pennsylvania, um, uh, the MD Anderson Cancer Clinic, Northwestern University. So. And if New Jersey, if, if Horizon's still in the room and they gave us your data, uh, Geisinger's still in the room, we'll take your data too. Um, <laughs> everyone talks about opening up and freeing up the data, but they really mean freeing it up inside. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions, please? Joe, yeah, to the mic. So I, have, I have a couple of comments, less questions, that I just sort of feel compelled to say. One of them is that um, we have tried standardizing those data sets. We have an X12 standard. We've been through that process. They exist. We've got four states that are moving into changing the rules to get into the standard and two more states that are using it. So we're not perfect, but we're getting there. So I, just, I don't want that to be lost, that, that I get Progress. it, that we, we should franchise this standard the same way we did McDonald's. I get it. Um, so I think that's important. The other thing that I, that I want to mention is that I think I, I agree with David um, that you know this isn't perfect data. That claims data aren't going to be perfect data for figuring out what a price of something's going to cost tomorrow. There are lots of issues around that, but we've seen good examples of ways that we get a little bit closer. And you know, I could point to two examples of people that I know who used a New Hampshire tool when their child, when they they had a high deductible health plan, um, they wanted to figure out which facility to go to. They used the tool. They figured it out. They saved a lot of money. So um, again, I don't think we're at transparent prices. I think we're sort of at opaque, maybe. Um, but we'll get there if, if the smart people can do that job. So again, I don't think all is lost around that. So you know, I, I, would, I would feel remiss if I didn't mention that, that I think while the states have done their own thing because there hasn't been a place to point, um, there is some also work at the rate review states to try to work together. I mean, I don't think that they're not working together as states wanting to be in a silo. I think it's partly that there's not a, an opportunity or a floor for them to convene around that. Um, that is what our, our organization's been trying to do, and I think we're making some progress on that, and we're very, very encouraged that um, as the, the, the leading states in Massachusetts and Maine and others, they're going to share their stuff widely with other states. We may not see as disparate a set of activities as, as folks think that we have in the past or we might in the future. Thank you. Hi, so this is a university, and we do have some graduate students in the audience here who would be very interested in using claims data for academic research. So could you talk a little bit about what such yeah, a student Yeah, unfortunately, would do? I'd have to ask them to transfer to one of the academic partnership institutions. Um, <laughs> the, uh, unfortunately, we, the, the big data is really, really problematic. Um, um, to load the data set into SAS takes eight hours. Um, and um, we are building out, if, if people want to go to the history page on the Health Affairs blog, we have a blog piece on big data and what we're trying to build out in terms of a data enclave. Um, and we've begun by partnering with these eight universities who are truly partners in the sense that they're going to go down a very difficult path with us to figure out the technological requirements for working with large claims data sets. Um, and it's just not scalable beyond that initially. Um, ultimately, with their permission, we may be able to create a mirror image site and double the capacity of this. Um, but we've, at this point, it is limited to the eight academic partners. Um, but and, you will take applications for it. Yeah, but it will be in, the, in, in a subsequent round. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and there's immense demand, there's no doubt. You know, we, we have a waiting list of 12 universities. We have one slot left, and the universities are being dealt with as they contacted us. Um, but it's just, we are a small nonprofit with um, very limited resources. We're taking considerable financial risk associated with even the licensing program. And it's just a matter of, as they discussed this morning, managing risk. Um, yeah, yeah, go on, yeah. I just want to follow up on that. I mean, yeah. the census has very sensitive data. They have census research data centers. Yeah. The census research data centers are only in 
particular institutions, but anybody can get cleared and go and use those. Yes, so and, and the only Princeton problem is- could go to New York and do that. Right. So I, why aren't you using that kind of a model? Oh, I, I, be, because it's not cost effective to us as a small, we've got to go into data use agreements with the university, not with the individual licensee. Uh, and I can tell you with a very prominent uh, Boston University, I've been in contorted negotiations with them for well over a year um, under the notion that the university councils simply are um, out there trying to um, run, run the clock. <laughs> and when we... we, we, we Yeah, cross-university collaboration is easy. The yeah. question is how to create the platform to get this started. Yeah. All of us in this game want to see wide open data sharing. Yeah. We're deeply committed to open science. The question is how to get some momentum and traction, how to develop policies and procedures that will make it work well. But I think, and I speak for our group, I mean, we're very eager to figure out how this model works and how we share it before we want to, want to get it started. We're happy, but in the end, every, more people should have access, not fewer. Yeah. David and I were talking about this at the outset. The idea wasn't to sequester this among a few experts, but to just figure out how we get some early wins, develop the momentum, so that ultimately everybody can have access. You shouldn't win in science because you have special access to data. Yeah. It should be based on your clever ideas, your rigorous methodology, your ability to translate it to yeah. benefit for others. That's the premise. But that is how, it, in my youth at least, is that whoever had the data was the monopolist and you had to to them. I think if money is your constraint, yep. we, we could talk about that. Uh, because some foundations could pull. There might be uh, the Frist Foundation or well, whatever. I, I think that shouldn't be the constraint. Well, we approached foundations, and foundations will not fund core functions. That is exactly the answer we got. Um, we offered a seat model to a major foundation to support researchers mm -hmm. under a master license agreement, and it was turned down. We don't, with the answer, we don't support core funding. If you go to a foundation and ask them, can I collect data and conduct a survey, they'll pay you. If you want a grant that hosts data and provides IT support, that's core funding. They want you to go somewhere else. They want deliverables. Mm -hmm. They want to see product. Uh, and after two and a half years of banging on foundation doors, this was a model that allowed us to get the data into a wider... Well, one way to do yeah. it is to make it a project, so Princeton will have a project come to you, pay you, to cover your costs. And that's what, that's what these eight initial partners are doing. And I think that's mm -hmm. the model. Yeah. So after listening yeah. to this yeah. discussion... Yeah. <laughs> we, we can do this offline, yes. <laughs> so after listening to this discussion, there's little wonder there's not uniformity among states if Princeton can't even agree with you to use your data, huh? <laughs> the, uh, but to your EOR glass half full, I would take Uwe's metaphor and look at it positively. The, the plane may be a little wobbly, but I've just returned from Maine, where the Maine Health Management Coalition, sophisticated purchasers are putting those databases to work. Um, if I live in Alabama, your project is great, but the Blues have 75% of the market, so even if you had a public-facing website, which you really don't, it wouldn't be a lick of good to me. So I think the question is, you know, we've got to have these little ununiform poor experiments move forward while we can try to get the uniformity that she was talking about. So I think people shouldn't be dissuaded by the fact that there's not a model that we can all feed into or that, you know, his model's voluntary, so that doesn't work if Horizon doesn't want to play ball. So there's no alternative to fiat in some cases to surface the data. And then it's a question of resolving some of the issues that they had. But sophisticated purchasers are already using this data to shake up the hospital system in New Hampshire. And I don't want to scare you, Christy, but that's what will happen to okay. The data gets open other mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. Dave? Two comments. I'd like to get back to the vendors and the consumer and all of this. Uh, uh, first, a comment on uh, Professor Reinhardt's comment uh, about Maryland. I've been an admirer of that system for a long time. Uh, but Maryland, the one thing Maryland doesn't do is they're not transparent in quality data. None of their hospitals report any quality data whatsoever to CMS. They negotiated. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So while we hold them up as an example, and, it's, and they are actually in the rate setting system, uh, without quality data, it's dangerous. Uh, 
Totally. My, my, my question is, as economists, how do you how do you view the strategies that we're seeing now as the as the exchange is blowing up? We're seeing networks radically now. Yeah. Uh, we sit, we saw an article in the New York Times about the lack of access to comprehensive cancer centers as as part of the strategy. Well, the, the nation had a long debate, which started during the Clinton period. The debate has never actually been about technique. That's just our, we think we can fool God with that, but God is too smart. This is all about the ethics of, the distributional ethic of the healthcare system. Other nations who control costs have all payer systems, regulated prices, and they do it that way. We decided, and liberals lost the debate, to ration healthcare by income class. And what we are seeing is increasingly moving in that direction, high deductibles in the employment-based system, ever higher, uh, very high deductible, actually, a lot of out-of-pocket exposure under the Clinton, under the uh, Obama exchanges, and of course these narrow networks. And we, we will just have to see what our young people who are taking over from us will do with this. They may be quite comfortable with having poor people who pay low premiums go to narrow networks of low quality providers. They may be comfortable with that and saying, you know, the, the higher quality, more expensive uh, systems uh, or insurance policies with lot more choice is for us, the deserving uh, people who, and so on. I personally believe that's where we're going. I think we're going to, through a, to a three-tier system. I think, you know, the liberals, step by step, have lost this debate to the conservative right, who essentially wants to ration health care income class. And that's where we're going in this country, and this is just a manifestation of that. This could change if it were decided that these networks are really not good quality and it's not fair to the people on the exchange to be bound to them. But I don't see the culture, uh, maybe I watch too much Fox News, uh, <laughs> going that way. You know. There is a pretense in this country, which I, I find reprehensible, that we all want the same things we're talking about, the mechanics, and they say it's exactly the opposite. We all understand the mechanics, and we know what works. Uh, we all don't want the same thing. And that debate, is, as long as I've been here, I've written about it and continue to write about it. People get very nervous when you do it. They're very angry when you actually do it. Uh, but that is why the narrow networks are there. This is the very best deal Obama could squeeze out of this country. That's how you have to look at it. He couldn't get any better. And I think on the narrow networks, in some states there will be a narrow network backlash and greater regulation of what those networks look like. And in other states, all of those complaints will fall you know, on deaf ears. Like, that's my question. Yeah. This network issue yeah. is a huge issue. Huge. It is. Yep. What does huge. It look like? Where, where they have tried to address it, what's it look like? I, you don't know? Not yet, no. no but California will tell us. Because they're probably, they're usually a pretty. Uh, state, sophisticated people, but they have also their budget limits and other limits, and they have narrow networks, and we'll see where that goes there. Uh, well, they put the reference-based pricing on there. They, they, you know, a reference, as I say, it could be used intelligently in a way that doesn't really raise ethical issues, but it could also be used 
in a way that raises serious ethical issues, depending again on where you, what your ethics are. I, I'm a brain damaged European Canadian, so <laughs> I have a certain distinct really? social <laughs> ethic. That's redundant. We have time for one last, one last question. No, th thank you. I've enjoyed your comments about the Maryland system. I'm a Philadelphia native who actually goes down to uh, Bon Secours uh -huh. in Baltimore, in West Baltimore, and serve on their board and been doing it for six years. The all payer system there is phenomenal. I, I want to, the one comment about the, we don't report our measures to CMS. HCAPS is reported, so if you go into the HCAPS tool, you can actually see where our patient satisfaction scores are relative to the others. Now, some of the other measures aren't necessarily reported to, to CMS, but we do examine them. And for example, we know in the state of Maryland, readmissions is a big issue right now. But what I wanted to ask you and get some free consulting support from you at this time is we're, we're going to a global payment system in, in uh, Bon Secours in West Baltimore, uh, serving a, a socioeconomically tough community, anywhere equivalent to what's going on in Trenton and Camden. Uh, what are the pitfalls? What are the things that we should look for? What are, what are some of the concerns that I need to think about as a board member as we're moving to this global payment system? Well, the way I see it, the way the, the waiver was written, they put the hospital in charge, right, yes, uh, right. of these areas. But I, I, I'm old fashioned. I always think you, you cannot ever run a system that doesn't have physicians really in the driver's seat on these issues. So the question is, how, how do you uh, get your primary care physicians to be part of that, right? And, and ultimately, in some way, you, you're in charge, but it's the physicians you work with that have to make this thing work for you. And that, I think that would be the challenge. And I'm not sure you're quite there yet. There's, there's actually there's a, some more discussions going on around applying the gain sharing system that's in New Jersey down into West Baltimore too, and those discussions are going. Yeah, on that right. would be uh, let them uh, gain share. So we'll, yeah. we'll keep looking at it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. hey, do you have a? a Thank view? you. Nothing. Thanks everyone, and thanks to the Nicholson Foundation. This has been an enjoyable day so far. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you. 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 Time of day to do this. I know, and I energize the future there. Just have to give them an No, no, I understand all of that. But you, they actually have lungs. Yeah. He's in the middle of the conference. He's way up top. Do you want me to yell for this one? Yeah. We go back to the I should close our main list to Jesus' name. And then we just started to go We don't use the data until we're still limiting the name, so we can leave for analysis of the data. We don't use it until 2007.
Janet, you know, not to be rude, but I have to go after yeah, the yeah, I know. Thanks for okay. coming. Oh, this was, was great. great. You're going to have my cookie. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to take it with you. No. no one's watching. Boy, oh, yeah. nice. Okay. Thank you. Oh, good to see you. Thank you. How are you? Good. Okay. Good. All right. Should I sit here? Okay. Sit over there? Sure. Okay. Okay. We're supposed to talk about New Jersey. Yeah. Good. All right. We're going to just keep going, so thank you for uh, sticking with us. It's going to be a great panel, and then we will have a wrap-up and then a break. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Woodrow Wilson School. Thank you, Nicholson Foundation. I'm pleased to be here. I'm Linda Schwimmer. I'm the Vice President at the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute. And all of you must be our big data liberation leaders because you're still here on a Friday, and we really appreciate that. Um, I told my panel that I will feel as though we have not been as creatively as disruptive as I know we can be if you're not all up out of your seats at the end of this shouting, liberate the data. So you better not disappoint me, all right? Especially if you want to be invited back. Um, I am honored by my fellow panelists. Today we have Dr. Jeff Brenner, who's the founder, executive director of the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers, and um, was featured on uh, WHYY. It woke me up this morning when the first words I heard was, accountable care organizations. That's a wonky word. <laughs> so welcome, Dr. Brenner. I thought you were dreaming. <laughs> um, Joel Cantor, who's here on my right, is the Center for State Health Policy at Rutgers University, a familiar face to all of us who've worked in, um, in healthcare and healthcare policy in the state of New Jersey. And so I'm pleased to have you here, Joel. And on my left is Jan Dr. Janet Curry, who's a, the Henry Putnam Professor of Economics and Public Affairs and the Director for the Center of Health and Wellbeing at the Woodrow Wilson School here at Princeton University. So thank you for being such a great host to us today, Janet. Um, so we're gonna get started. What I asked, I had great discussions with uh, my panelists in advance, and a uh, few themes uh, came together from those conversations. And those themes focused on the following uh, five items. And so the way we are going to run the panel today is um, we're going to focus on these five themes. Um, I'm going to ask all of them to jump in, even interrupt each other if necessary. And then we're going to spend some time at the end um, so you can jump in as well. So the themes that have emerged are access. They're all data users. What are some of the uh, strategies that they've used here in New Jersey to accelerate their progress? And what are some things that have impeded their progress? Ownership. What, what makes data proprietary? Or when should it be really thought of as a common asset? Potential for a win-win. When can we actually share data in a way that the owners of the data and the users of the data, whether they're providers, whether they're policymakers, or God forbid, patients themselves, um, actually make this a win-win in the sharing process? Um, the actual use. If we get this data, are we going to waste this opportunity? How can we use it and use it right? And finally, leadership, and I, I take this back to you, leadership. How can we really drive change? We've, we've heard about examples in other states across the country where there really is true leadership on this. We've seen some examples up here at this podium today of true leadership in other places. We don't lack leaders here in New Jersey, so how can we really change the landscape here? How can we really change what's happening so that we can create sustainable leadership to actually use this data to improve the healthcare landscape here in New Jersey, which um, I know we can do. So with that, I'm gonna kick it right over. You're all data users, and um, what has, uh, give me some examples of where you've used New Jersey data sets or other data sets, and um, where your progress has been accelerated or impeded. Uh, Janet, why don't you uh, start us off? Okay, thanks very much. I uh, want to go back to the idea that Anish Chopra was talking about a data, sorry, is that better? A data mashup. 
So I want to very quickly show you three data mashups using New Jersey data, hopefully to find out something interesting. So the first example here is from a study that I did with, with Hannah Schwant, a postdoc here who's over here, looking at seasonal effects in health at birth. So what you can see on your left, there's a graph of gestation length. So for babies who were conceived in May, gestation length is much shorter. And that just pops out when you look at a million births. Okay? Um, the green line here is saying within mothers, do you see that pattern? And yes, you do. So even if you have a mother who has two babies at different times of year, if the baby is conceived in May, it's more likely to be premature. The graph on your right is trying to get at a possible reason for that, which is looking at flu cases and when they peak. And you can see from the graph that you get a nice lineup of the peak in flu cases with the peak in prematurity. Uh, so in the paper, we look further at that by looking at the H1N1 epidemic in 2009, where the peak in the flu was earlier in the year, and sure enough, you see that the peak in prematurity is earlier in the year as well. So this actually got quite a lot of attention, but another theme that came up is that even if you're using the data, you don't always get the uh, message that you want. So these are the sort of messages that we that the press took away from our study. <laughs> so we thought the message was that pregnant women should get flu shots, and, and this, is, <laughs> this is what we got. So, so you have to work on, on that aspect of it. Uh, one, one other example I want to talk about, this is from a study looking at hospital discharge data. So the first one was using birth records from New Jersey, from the electronic birth records. This is using hospital discharge data. So what we've done here is just to link zip code level data on foreclosures in New Jersey with hospital admissions for preventable uh, conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and so on. So you can see uh, that there's a clear increase in admissions for these conditions when there's foreclosure, which is making that connection between economic conditions and health. Uh, another idea is looking at relationships between pollution and health. This is going back to the birth data, and this is from a study where we used the rollout of EasyPass in New Jersey. And what we did was zero in on women who lived near EasyPass toll plazas. And what you can see is that there's a reduction in prematurity for women who live near EasyPass toll plazas after the, the rollout of the Easy Pass. So those are just three examples. And uh, so going back to, to Linda's question, I would say that uh, you know, I have been able to get access to data in order to do these studies. So on the whole, my experience has been positive. Um, it, it wasn't easy. And so that maybe that's the negative side. It took a long time. Uh, people were willing to work with me but there were many barriers to be overcome in terms of personnel, in terms of computing power, um, in terms of coming up with some kind of agreement to keep the data secure uh, and still allow research to go on. So um, I think, and it's only one example, there's much more that you could do. For example, researchers in Florida have linked birth data with education data and were able to show that children who were late premature were much more likely to have educational disabilities later on. And that kind of work was influential in getting people to stop doing early C-sections, since that was a big driver of the increase in early premature deliveries. So there's a lot of important health research, public health research that can be done. Um, some of it is being done in New Jersey, and you'll hear many other examples, but there are still a lot of obstacles to be overcome, especially in terms of linking data from one silo to data in another silo. You want more examples? I didn't know I could bring slides. Sure. No, no, so, slides. I'm not as insightful as Uva, but I'm just as <laughs> funny. I, uh, <laughs> so um, so um, 
we use actually some of the same data, and uh, I wanted to mention well, one thing, um, and I, of course I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it was supported by the Nicholson Foundation. Uh, but uh, using the same hospital discharge data, uh, we've, uh, at least for now, achieved longitudinality. Earlier we heard about the challenge of doing this kind of work with de-identified data, um, uh, which precludes then following up over time to see what happens to people. Uh, and really inspired by work by Jeff and, and the Camden Coalition, um, we wanted to know, well, what who are the high users and what are those patterns? And when you just have billing record data, you don't know who the high users are because all you know is each bill, one, one discharge at a time. Um, so uh, with uh, Nicholson support and with uh, the cooperation of the State Health Department, we sort of tutored them through linking these records over time for individuals. Uh, and also we linked in uh, charity care data and mortality data because you need to know when people are no longer able to be admitted because they've met their demise. Um, so, uh, and, and that, and, and so we have put out statewide uh, data on um, uh, who are the high users, or not who they are, we don't disclose that, but uh, what their characteristics are and Im Im importantly, how the rates of high users really vary across low-income communities uh, in, in the state. And there's enormous uh, variation, three and four-fold variation across communities with similar, similar demographics. I mean, we're doing more work now to try to explain that, that variation. Uh, hopefully, we, uh, those data have stimulated some communities to come to the table under the New Jersey Medicaid ACO demo um, to um, to create strategies uh, and to, to jump in, create organizations to, to sort of deal with, with, with these problems. But that, that is one example. Um, but it's, it's, I want to mention its limitations as well. Uh, there are, uh, uh, the health department is underfunded and understaffed, uh, and they've been great in working with us. Uh, we don't actually see the identifiers, they do it. Um, we usually have to send a graduate student in to hold their hand through it, but now they've said they no longer have the capacity uh, to do that. We're asking for too much. Um, uh, and uh, so I think now we have to take the next step and really open discussions uh, about, uh, well, how can we move uh, fully identified data into a space where there's more capacity to do that kind of work and yet um, actively protect the privacy and the confidentiality of, of those data. So those conversations are beginning. Around the country, we worked with about uh, 20 different hospitals data sets, um, starting with Camden hospitals, so Cooper, Lords, and Virtua. And what we found is it's a really important tool for getting conversations started. So I think of this data as less about um, making conclusions than generating conversations and generating hypotheses. So I think it, it puts people in a position to ask much better questions. And I think it's um, certainly in Camden, it's made us ask lots of questions about what's wrong with healthcare and what we could be doing better. Um, we've also spent some time with the homelessness data set. There is a census done in every um, major community of homeless patients, and it's an interesting data set. It's not a perfectly scientific representative data set because it's hard to find homeless people. Um, we did some matching between that data set and our healthcare data set and saw expensive patterns, patterns that we knew already. Um, and recently we've gotten from the state of New Jersey their uh, data set for Medicaid transportation for the city of Camden and for Camden County. Um, and it's letting us once again ask better questions about why they've organized the system the way it is. We know anecdotally from many, many patients and providers that the Medicaid transportation system has as much failure as the whole healthcare system has as well in Camden. Uh, so the data sets uh, helping us really answer, uh, begin to ask better questions about why the system was put, put together the way it is. So when I was at uh, Horizon, I, I saw that through our patient-centered medical home project, one of the things that was absolutely just as important as um, providing greater financial incentives to the physicians was actually providing them with the data. Because when they saw the data, just as you were saying, Jeff, it started the conversation. They could also see how they were doing compared to their peers, their you know, A through F labeled peers, not their peers by name, but their A through F labeled peers. 
and physicians are competitive by nature, and it, it started conversations, and it drove changes in behavior. And it got me thinking, and I know you guys have thought about this, what makes that information proprietary? If, if we're stripping out the cost elements of it, and now this is claims data, and this is utilization patterns, this, these are ICD-9 and maybe one day 10 submissions, why is this proprietary? I mean, just would kind of, Joel, you start. What do you think? Um, so I, th I, I guess my, my perspective on this is, um, is, is that we have to look at who's, who, who the data belong to and also who's paying for the data. And um, uh, when we talk about private health plans, we think, well, it's, it's private. Uh, private premiums paying for that. But in fact, uh, the U.S. tax system uh, subsidizes private health insurance premiums and aggregates some of roughly what states and the federal government spend on Medicaid uh, every year. It's not a trivial amount of money. Uh, plus, we're now uh, requiring, as a, as a matter of law, that almost everybody purchase health insurance. So we, we have the, the government intervening here in a big way. Uh, I think that the, that comes, uh, th those who are uh, receiving those funds uh, then have a responsibility to contribute to knowledge about um, how the system's working uh, and uh, um, uh, how we can tackle the tough problems that we still have that don't seem to be going away, namely um, cost. Um, so um, that's not a legal argument, it's more of a moral argument that I think uh, these things are naturally in the public domain. Um, uh, you know, of course, the counter argument is that uh, it's all about price and, the, and that, you know, our system is structured so that we, uh, to the extent we control costs, it's, a, it's about negotiations between these payers uh, and the providers. And if, those, if that information is disclosed, then we're worse off as we heard earlier, then all, uh, we may reduce the variation in prices, but we're going to raise the average uh, price or the av average cost. And that, 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 is, that is a concern. Um, but uh, if one were to uh, l limit the definition of proprietary to those negotiated rates, uh, I would think even, uh, and I think this is what you're suggesting, releasing those data in a protected way um, uh, really would advance our policy goes quite a lot. So um, I, I think uh, you know, sort of bottom line is that the, the private sector often is hiding behind this notion of proprietary-ness. Uh, and, and, um, you know, and I fully understand uh, the desire to hide uh, their com competitive advantage. And also I fully understand that it's very costly to put this information together and, and put it out uh, and then to have to respond to all the um, the queries that come from people um, interrogating the data, but I do think it's an obligation. So maybe to get to the expense issues, the public utility idea that was mentioned earlier. Yeah. Do you have enough thoughts? It feels to me like when a public, when a system fails to the level that healthcare is failing the American public, um, it's used up its its goodwill. And in New Jersey, we spend. Um, more per Medicare recipient than any other state in the country. 25% of Medicare recipients go through an intensive care unit on the way to dying twice many other states. A Medicare recipient is more likely to see 10 different specialists in the last six months and last two years of life than any other state. Those are statistics of deep and profound failure. We have built two $800, $900 million buildings 10 miles apart, just a few miles from here. And none of you voted for that, but you will be paying for it the rest of your life, and your kids will be paying for it. Princeton Medical Center and Capital Health Medical Center were not necessary. And undergirding those buildings are uh, federal funds, there are state bond funds, lots and lots of state money, and lots of your tax money. If your copay, your deductible, and your employee contribution go up, you can thank Princeton Medical Center and Capital Health for that. The most dangerous thing in America is an empty hospital bed, and we've created a lot of very expensive empty hospital beds 10 miles apart. There aren't enough sick people in Princeton to fill all those beds. <laughs> so, you know, so the question is, how do you prove that? And without the data, you can't prove it. So you know, I think that healthcare has long gone past um, uh, 
the point where it's really abusing the public trust, and the only way to prove that is to have the data. Um, the most interesting experiment of this happened up in Massachusetts, where the Attorney General outed the fee schedules of all of the hospitals um, for all the insurers, and what they found, it, this had never been done before, they found completely irrational variability that didn't follow any of the no normal laws of economics where uh, hospitals that were higher quality were being paid more. Um, it, it made no sense and it created public outrage and the impact of the public outrage were laws that then changed how hospitals and doctors are being paid in Massachusetts. We need that in New Jersey. We need to out the disgrace of how doctors and insurance companies are paying hospitals. So at a very general level, I think a lot of these issues come up, uh, even stepping away from big data. We always have questions about public health and how to safeguard public health and then individual rights, right? So some people in the US don't wanna drink fluoridated water even though it's good for their teeth. Right? But we make those kinds of trade-offs all the time, and that's why I asked earlier about the, the trade-offs, right? Because we know that there's risks of making data mm -hmm. available, but there's also benefits, as mm -hmm. Jeff was saying. So how do we turn this into a win-win then? I mean, how do we make it so that it's not a question of Joel going to the Department of Health and saying, I want to look at your data, do X, Y project, and they're saying, gee, we'd like to help you, but we don't have the staff. How can Joel go to them and Joel's request somehow helps them or somehow helps somebody else? I mean, thoughts on? I don't think we need to help them. They work for us. We pay their salaries <laughs> and we pay their taxes. And if they won't free the data set to be usable for scientific purposes by academic researchers and they don't have the resources, then we need to petition the legislature and ask for changes to the law and more oversight of government. So it's not that I don't believe in win-win situations, but we shouldn't be having to have a negotiation with our own government so that they win and we win. Like there's a... Actually, you know, Jeff, I've, I've uh, made that argument myself, but I know it's a losing argument. <laughs> like every time I made that argument, it was because I was totally frustrated and it meant I was never going to get the data. So, <laughs> um, but I... I do think public health agencies have mandates of things that they're supposed to be doing. They have things that they want to know. And usually uh, they feel like either they can't know them or they have to go out and hire some expensive consultant to run a survey, do something to find out what it is that they want to know. I, I think that there would be a lot of room for you know, putting out a request for proposals, saying you know, we want to know more about these things and then saying, in return, we will give you access to the data that you need in order to answer those questions. You could probably do a tremendous amount more important public health research under that kind of cooperative scenario than is able to be done now. Um, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I, I um, I think there's goodwill on the part of the, the public data holders. There's, but there is, um, there are, they face a lot of obstacles, and some of it's funding. And I think it is up to us, their constituents, to um, tell our policymakers where we think resource allocation ought to be. Um, they also are, you know, in, incredibly conservative in, in terms, and I don't mean that politically, but in, in terms of the risks involved. And uh, that, that's, that's understandable. You know, data breaches are happening almost daily now. And um, so uh, I think in addition to thinking about the funding, we need to think about putting structures in place that give them the assurance uh, that the information will be properly protected. Um, and the wonderful panel earlier, uh, you know, I think talked about how we have to think about risk. And I think we, the data users, really have to do that as well. And, um, you know, uh, it's incumbent on us uh, to put those structures in, in, in place that give everyone the assurance uh, that it's safe. Can I say a little bit more about these census data centers? Because I, I think it is an interesting model. So there are very strict laws that protect census data. If you violate those laws, you can go to jail for a very long time. Um, 
in order to get into the Census Data Center, you are investigated, you have to give your fingerprints. So I'm not saying that I, I necessarily advocate that, but I'm saying there is this model that exists. The data, you know, not only does it never leave the Census Data Center, it never leaves Washington. So people go to the Census Data Center all over the country, so they could be in Berkeley or Chicago or New York, and they're logging into the the census servers in Washington to use the data. And then whatever they do is vetted before it can be taken out. So there has never been a data breach in the yeah. census data centers. And you know maybe there will be someday. But it's not like they're giving data or trying to de-identify it or doing any of those things. They're just saying, OK, we're going to make it available under these very restricted conditions. And, um, and it works very well. Lots of people have gained access to data and done very interesting work that way. So assuming that we could get access to the data or the government or the health insurance companies or others who have it have deemed that it is a win-win situation and Janet has persuaded them in, in her persuasive way um, and she pulled Jeff back from the edge. Um, <laughs> What would we do with it? And I know, Jeff, you've thought a lot about this, so I'm going to kind of kick it over to you. I mean, how can we use it in the most productive way? So I, I think there are six failures of data in how we use healthcare data. Um, so let me, let me list them out. This won't take long. Um, I think we're obsessed with prediction instead of surveillance. And prediction is trying to guess rare events off in the future instead of paying attention to the events that happen right now. So we want to know, you know, tell me which sick person is going to be hospitalized three months from now so I can call them on the phone. Meanwhile, the hospital is full of sick people who've been back over and over and over. Or this month, there's a woman in Camden who's been to the emergency room three times for sexually transmitted disease. No one is going to call her. No one is going to follow up. Her primary care provider is unaware of it. So that's a failure to surveil data. Um, another example is, it was brought up earlier about stratification versus segmentation. These linear constructs that you're going to line every sick person up from tallest to shortest instead of doing what advertising and, and frankly American business has done, which is segmenting people into categories and making sure they get their needs met. We centralize data instead of decentralizing it. So all over hospitals and frankly all over healthcare, it's locked away in the IT department, and the IT department is really, really, really good at connecting the pipes and making sure no one breaks into the pipes. They are not very good at analyzing data. It's a very different mentality. So you throw questions in with an RFS process to someone locked in a dark room, and then wait three months for the answer to come back out. And then the answer bears no resemblance to the question you asked in the first place, and you eventually give up and throw your hands up. And what should happen is that next to every program manager, next to every Project director is sitting a data analyst, and you can ask questions in real time. The fourth failure of data is to be obsessed with averages, and our biostatisticians and epidemiologists rule the roost here and have ruined data sets, and, it's the, and they cut off the outliers. The outliers are the part of the data that messes up the data set, but the outliers <laughs> are the most important part of the data set because they tell you what's failing in the system that you're studying. So look at the outliers, not the averages. So super utilizers are just outliers. They are the best people to tell you about all the system failures. We're also uh, much more focused on numerators than denominators. Numerators are the event. Denominators are the absence of an event. So, and we've actually messed this up many times in Camden. And, uh, and the last one is uh, what I'd mentioned earlier about um, instead of being worried about conclusions from the data, we should be looking for better hypotheses. And most of our failures are asking the wrong question or asking very blunt questions or unrefined questions. So um, most of what we do in, in Camden is use data like a natural scientist exploring variability and generating hypotheses and refining the hypotheses. We're not looking for correlation. So all over big data, we're obsessed with correlation. and. Uh, correlation is really just beneficial to generate hypotheses. Correlation can, it's very hard to go to causation. Causation can go in all different directions. You can end up making very incorrect conclusions. So all these big data sets should do is to go in that direction. And that's about all it's going to do for us. Um,
anything to add or subtract to the list? No, that 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 is a great list. Um, you know, the um, that's where longitudinality comes in too, because usually if A causes B, A happens before B, and we use. Uh, so many data sets that are snapshots um, that we 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 don't know the direction of even the direction of causality even if we have a good hypothesis. So. I, I just want to add that hypothesis making is dynamic. Mm -hmm. So what happens uh, if things are going well is that you reject your hypothesis, right? right? <laughs> and then you come up with a new hypothesis and maybe you reject that one too. So even if you started with a good list you know, the best list of questions to be looked at with big data today, then tomorrow it would be a different list. So you have to keep that in mind. And this is where I think the, in some ways the privacy laws work against good information. So you can't get uh, approval for a research process, a research project under, under uh, using HIPAA protected data unless you have the minimum necessary data to answer a specific or address a specific hypothesis. Well, then if you say you disprove that hypothesis uh, or reject the hypothesis, uh, you've learned a great deal, now you start over and you have to reapply. So, um, you know, I'd, I'll look to the lawyers to solve that problem, but it, it's, uh, there, it, stacks, it stacks the deck against good science, I think. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously all of you want to have access to data. You're doing, you're doing cool, important things with this data. How do we get there? I, I pose the question as leadership because I see it happening in other places, but is that the right question? And, um, and if so, how do we develop that leadership? How do we take what's interest in a, in a lovely day in Princeton and turn it into a bit of a movement? Uh, I, think, uh, I think it was around um, the minimum wage law and Obama said at a rally, don't get angry, organize. <laughs> I mean, what? This is great, but 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 what what do we need here in New Jersey to, to, to move the needle so that you guys can get this data? I guess as an educator, I tend to always say education, <laughs> but um, I think one of the big problems is that people just don't understand that data is useful for anything. Um, again, y you don't just have to look at health, but you know, look at something like unemployment. Everybody assumes that the government knows what unemployment is. Well, how does the government know that? Right? They have to measure it somehow, and that involves real resources. And it's the same thing with every kind of public health problem, uh, except in the case of public health, we already have a lot of the data and just nobody's ever allowed to look at it. Uh, so having people understand that it's actually useful and that you can answer questions using the data that we have and you don't have to go out and run a whole other survey to answer some question would be a useful first step. So when you say useful, useful to whom? Do you mean the patient, the provider, the payer, the government, policy makers, to whom? All of the above. Yeah, it, need, it needs to be all of the above and there need to be different kinds of arrangements, you know, the. The, the Camden Coalition and similar organizations really need the data for the, you know, if we really want to do population health, one needs data for the whole population and not just the numerator, not just the, you know, who's in the hospital today, uh, but to understand who's at high risk because um, they come from a group that is hospitalized often. And um, so, and there's the legal framework permits that you know, access to data for, for public health purposes and for clinical purposes. So we need to push the data down to, and I, I think the ACO model in New Jersey has uh, lots of limitations, but one of the great things is it's population-based and, and collaborative across the whole community. So I think, um, you know, now that that structure is in place, I think one next step is to, is to do whatever is legally necessary to have, to provide them with access to the to the information needed to do population health management for the whole for the whole community, that would be a big next step. I think uh, on uh, on the research side, I think creating data enclaves outside of government that allow for more nimble funding by foundations, by federal grants, whatever it is, to do um, research applications. I think uh, uh, is important, and I think we should move in that in that direction. I don't think we can expect. Uh, the state health department or the Medicaid program to be 
analytic support shops. I just, uh, you know, they have too many responsibilities and too little resources to do that. So I think we need to create that in parallel with government and in cooperation with government. That said, I just want to do a little small shout out. I noticed today um, that the Department of Banking and Insurance put up a new uh, uh, tool on their website. And Christine, you're, I see you're here. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this yet, but it's a s small group insurance market uh, premium calculation tool, which is wonderful. So part of the ACA, and New Jersey had this before, is the uh, premium rate review process with a lot of good data on, on premiums. But in small groups, it's, it's enormously difficult to actually know what your premium is going to be because you need to know the demographics of everyone who's going to sign up in your group and so on. But they put this nice, simple tool that draws on um, the reported data. Uh, so now that information is a lot more transparent. So uh, I think there is hope that government can do more of this. They can do it in this case because they have a federal grant to do it. That's going to end. So then <laughs> what's next? So anyway, I think using our new um, coalition structures um, to do population health management is number one, creating a mechanism uh, for uh, a data enclave for research purposes is number two. And then, you know, hoping government keeps that doing more good stuff is number three. A very wise advocate for change. Um, our own Dave Knowlton told me that the price of admission is a plan. And I actually think the hardest part about um, this is figuring out what we want and what should the architecture look like. It's not simple. I mean, when we've, we've talked in sort of very broad terms, but when you get down to the details of actually how you would structure this, um, it's actually quite complicated. So I think the first step is uh, for us to get a clearer vision of what we want. Um, I don't think waiting on the executive branch of New Jersey, and there are people here from the executive branch, I love you guys, you guys work really hard on our behalf, but there is a massive wave of retirement going on in state governments all over the country, including our state, and you know a lot of knowledge is leaving state government. So, uh, and also state government is risk averse for good reasons. I think this, this is the kind of problem that you go to the legislature. So waiting on executive action is just not the way to get this done. This requires a new architecture and I think this is the kind of architecture that you, you petition the people's body, the legislature, you create a plan, you create a framework, that framework gets put into law, and then you know, hopefully we create a structure that is um, multiple entities can access data properly. You know, I think what we've got are obsolete structures, obsolete systems, and you know, the world has gone way past the tools that government has created for this. So, you know, I think it's incumbent upon us to kind of figure out what's the new architecture in this. For that purpose, we've put together uh, a coalition statewide that we're calling the Good Care Collaborative. And the really, the genesis behind this is the idea that uh, in healthcare reform right now, what we've done is spent a whole lot of time arguing about how to pay for care. And it would be like going to a car dealership and spending two hours talking to uh, the salesperson about how to finance your car getting back in your old car, driving away, looking at your spouse and saying, we forgot to look at the cars. What do we want to buy? So I think we need to shift the debate now from how to pay for care and whether to cover everyone to what do we want to buy, what does good care look like, and actually visit different models of good care. So last month, we visited an ACT team. Uh, we also have visited a PACE program. Uh, we're going to be visiting the Nurse Family Partnership. We're going to be visiting various models around the state a very good care for very high risk specific populations. At the same time, there's a different part of the group working on advocacy. And one of the major advocacy topics is freeing the data. So there's a group of lawyers, including John Jacoby here, uh, convening to start talking about the shape of what an architecture would look like, uh, folks from Joel's shop. So, you know, I'm, I'm saying this because, you know, there aren't a lot of other people concerned about this topic. It's sort of this room and maybe a few others, but you're welcome to uh, join in and contributing to what we're trying to do. Uh, thank you. So should we open it up to questions? All right. Uh, questions for the panel? Yeah, a couple of suggestions, just based on working in 16 communities around the country, 15 of which have public reports on their data with a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation program called Aligning Forces for Quality. It's happened because of a few reasons. Uh, some communities, they got pissed off purchasers. And I don't see many big healthcare purchasers in the room other than state government, but uh, there are large self-insured uh, employers 
Uh, in some cases, they can't even get their own data from their insurance companies. They're very interested in uh, freeing this information up, particularly around prices, so I would suggest you try to bring them to the table. Other communities like Minnesota, it's been an enlightened legislature, uh, and so it's, it's been forced out. Uh, same within, you know, some of the other states that she talked about earlier today. Uh, in other places, there are multi-stakeholder collaboratives. Um, they're not meeting in isolation. They've managed to get the people who pay for care, the people who uh, provide care, and the people who um, get care all around the same table. Uh, and the consumer is a fairly important part of that. And they've had a neutral convening body, um, somebody that's trusted, that's not on anybody's team, uh, even though it was put together in some states by you know, purchasers, it was put together in other states by providers, other states by um, different organizations. But you know, it's hard to do it by yourself and it's hard to do it from a policy wonk angle. Uh, there's got to be people with money at the table, and that includes state. Uh, between Medicaid and state employees, they're one of the largest purchasers in the state. Nobody's got a bigger vested interest in getting better information than state government. So anyway, that's just the way it's, it's, it's happened in a few other places around the country. So those are some models to look at, but for what it's worth. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, Dudley, speaking of... Um the state, or the state workers, Dudley? Actually, I think I'm going to echo a lot of what you just said. Uh, I was kind of sitting here thinking you were talking about this and you know, going to the legislature, which is probably a good idea, but I'm not sure that next couple of years it will be that fruitful. That's not to say not to do it, not to prepare the groundwork. But, uh, you know, the payers, I mean, definitely. Uh, you know, we look at it... Uh, it's essentially our advisors come in and uh, say, well, and I'm going to pick on Horizon uh, because they're, they're essentially the insurance company for state government. Uh, not that anybody else is any different, but they say, you know, look, Horizons, they give you the best, best discounts. They're the toughest negotiators with the hospitals and so forth. And we kind of don't look at that and say, does it really make any difference? You know, what are you buying? Uh, so I think there, there has to be something uh, from kind of the payer community, and uh, I think you're right. Some other places it's happened. It hasn't really happened uh, in, this, in, in New Jersey, and it definitely hasn't happened with the, the state, at least I, I can speak with some knowledge of the state employee, the public employee side. Uh, we really haven't had that conversation. I mean, you know, why wouldn't we be saying... Uh, you know, we want you to negotiate uh, aspects of uh, accountable care uh, with the insurers rather than just the discount piece. Or, you know, we want to make the, this data available to researchers to come in uh, so that we can have a better idea of how to structure uh, our plan and our benefits and if we want to do the, the reference-based pricing and that kind of thing. I would love to hook you up with my friends in Maine. The state employees led the way there because they saw that all their raises were going for health care costs. That's so true. The state employees actually led the purchasing movement in Maine. So how do we do reference-based pricing if we don't really have information? <laughs> in reference um, to what? Unless right. David wants to give us his, his database for free, which we would take. Yeah, he Florida. said, yes, you heard it. You heard it here. <laughs> how, how, how do we... How do we how do we energize a reference-based pricing without good we, information we have an around cost and quality? Oh, it's Kevin O'Brien in the lights. Could you want to come? For those of you, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm going to the microphone, but for those of you that have been watching CNN, missing are the profound human impactable stories that the data armed in the hands of the right providers at the right time will change. And uh, whispered to my colleague here, I, I had in 2012 vowed I was never going to touch healthcare data ever again after having dealt with it for over 20 years. Uh, but what pulled me back in was working with a colleague and recognizing that somebody in my town, Freehold, 
spent uh, the last, I think, nine months of their life uh, in and out of Central State Hospital. I think the number was 12 or 13 times. That's absolutely impractical, <coughs> avoidable, and it was a failure of our public, it, the discussions with my local public health uh, group, uh, and this was during a pro bono activism phase, uh, was this is a public health emergency. Your role, your charge is chronic disease management. We're failing, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And there are public health officers throughout the state that are looking to engage on this. There are healthcare leaders throughout the state that are looking to engage on this. Uh, Jeff is, has been able to uh, spur that. I know there are leaders in every segment of the state and I'm, the one place where I'll disagree with you is the pricing is absolutely an imperative. We have millions and millions of dollars changing hands irrationally. And as a result, we're not able to afford the right care to everyone for the prices that they are paying in anyway. So at the end of the day, you know, and to, to just challenge some of the assumptions where 16,000 different physician codes go to any specialty, 90% of every specialty falls within 20 codes. So let's dispense with that. Number two, the complexity of the healthcare system. If you go to your local mall, there are more prices posted in your local mall and probably in your local grocery store managed every single day than there are in, in healthcare databases. So let's dispense with that excuse. This is about a rational approach to price and quality to get to triple A and to be able to improve the value of the care that we're rendering. And that is the movement that you're talking about. And, and I would encourage the Quality Institute and the other uh, parts of the, uh, you know, the organizations here to start the movement. Enough already. We've been talking about this for 20 years. Kevin, don't get me wrong. I certainly didn't say price was an important or charge. No, I didn't. <laughs> Karen, all the way back there. Karen yeah, Clark. I think I'm loud enough as well. But just a, a point. Someone just mentioned you know, Medicaid, and obviously the state is some of the largest purchasers. So just you know, uh, speaking for the managed care organization from Horizon's Medicaid business, um, all of the claims data is reported. And Jeff knows this. All is reported to the state. That's a re mandate and a requirement that is checked. <coughs> I would not be able, as Horizon NJ Health, to give you the Medicaid data, but the state has it 100%. And uh, so, I, and I know Jeff can probably speak on that, you know, individual organizations being able to get that from the state. But it's yeah. there and available. Yeah. That's, that's Karen, did you want to chime in or no? And I, and I would just add yeah. to that that. Uh, Karen's with Optum, who yeah, runs the data we warehouse for the state. We do, but, you know, and I would just say that. With state data, one of the things you run into is that the perfect becomes the enemy of the good. Because the state, states get very, very, very frightened about flooding out data where there may be one part of it that's not right. And so it becomes this thing of it's better to keep it close than to get something out there that might be wrong. And that somewhere along the way, we really have to find a way to create a set of data that's considered research or informative. That's that's not considered perfect, but is close enough to inform the decision-making process and not let the idea that, you know, one person may be able to look and find that there's this one person in Camden whose code was slightly off or their gender was wrong in, in a pool of a million lives that would, you know, put the, to, which, which would make a risk-averse group of people, we said that, feel concerned about the information that's being put out there. And I think that's the big challenge is how do we, how do we define what's acceptable and not let the perfect be the enemy of the, what we need for a day-to-day -day basis. I don't need perfect to drive my car. Trust me, if you had to be perfect to drive a car, I wouldn't be driving. But you have to, but I'm good enough that I'm not going to kill anyone if I go down the street. And I think that's what we have to do also with That's true, and researchers spend a lot of time how to, how to um, draw solid conclusions from dirty data. And uh, 
you know, have pretty good techniques for doing that. So if that's a barrier uh, to release, um, it, it really, it really shouldn't be, at least to release for research purposes. Using data that has errors for clinical purposes, I have more issues with. It's the word, yeah, and, and the other thing I would add to that, I'm so sorry, I've been quiet all day, so now I'm in trouble. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that I would add is that we also need to find a way that sistering state people with private companies so that there's enough um, bandwidth there to allow the people who need the data in order to manage the healthcare business access to the data without it necessarily stopping the business of state government. And I think there are ways to do that. There's, there's, there are ways to fund that. But really, developing private sector experts on the data versus sister to state experts so that, that we can get data out to the people who need it to manage. This, the issue. Head. The issue of getting stuck on the perfect, I have an interesting anecdote in the research world, because that happens over on the research side as well. We wrote up our methods in a research article about how we connected three hospitals' data together, thinking, gee, you know, other people might want to do that in their community. And the article got rejected by the journal. And the response from the journal was that our data set wasn't statistically correct, because a certain number of Camden residents go over to Children's Hospital and therefore leak out of our data set. And I said to them, well, that just makes it worse. <laughs> so it's, you know, the story we've told in the data about what a mass Camden is, it, it's only a worse story when you add that data. It's, it's not that it makes the data invalid. Um, you know, if you're stuck on averages and means and, and kind of traditional statistics, yes. But, uh, so that's another example of where in our data universe, the perfect uh, becomes the enemy of the good as well. So I, I really like that idea of a public-private and I guess to the extent that Joel and I have been able to do anything, it's by having a sort of public-private partnership where we send graduate students or assistants to be able to get the data into shape that you could do something with it. So, so maybe that's a good label for uh, activities and things that we'd like to see more of. I don't want to outvote you, but I, I do want to nudge back in the sense that I know that behind closed doors you both have had incredibly frustrating experiences with the making it through the apparatus of the state. So everyone gets warm and fuzzy when we say public-private partnership, but, and it sounds really great when you, you know, you guys have produced really incredible results, but I think you've, you've lost three of your nine cat lives in the process of getting through some of the structures and the bureaucracy. So. Do you feel comfortable? I haven't had any problems. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it is a question of uh, resources, and um, you know, I don't think there's any ill will. I don't think any barriers are set up purposely. Uh, but you know, between uh, the pension costs and Medicaid costs, there aren't any resources left, and so. Um, you know, obviously it's short-sighted not to solve your Medicaid cost problem by withholding data, but um, uh, so very often um, things get very fragmented and they end up with it in the hands of people who don't have incentives or motivations to move things along. Um, you know, a data custodian who has to issue data use agreements so that data can be transferred from one agency, one entity within the same agency to another, it takes six months sometimes. Um, it's a resources problem and it's a priorities problem. And um, so um, I don't have a good solution for it, but it happens. Yeah, cer certainly what you say is, is true, and, and things have taken much longer than they really reasonably ought to have taken. So if it's a question of just somebody signing a piece of paper, right. that, and why does it take six months? That's a good question. Um, I have to say, though, that I've had worse experiences in other states, you know, so I've had states where you went through, you know, and, and I should say, in a lot of places, you have to go through three IRB processes. It's not one IRB process. So you have the IRB process at your university, you have the IRB process at the state level, and then you have the IRB process in the individual agency. So you can go through all of that, and then still, you know, and have jumped over all the hoops and then still have 
people pull the plug. I've, I've had people pull the plug after I've already done the research and say, no, we don't think we should have given you that data, so you can't publish it. Right? So there are worse scenarios. <laughs> yeah, and I should add also that, you know, we're dealing with about eight or nine states now with very similar data. This is, this is not a uniquely New Jersey problem by any stretch. Can you just put some, I think proportionality is really important here. So, you know, give an example of an outlier project, meaning, you know, a project that should have taken two months took three years. Or put some, you know, I think people in the audience should know, you know, what this really does to researchers. And <coughs> this is not a rare occurrence. So I think for both of you, you've had a project where the analysis is really like a one month, two month project, but the project took X number of years. Well, I, I had a, um, a two year project uh, where we submitted the, the, the paperwork to get the, the data approvals in place in, the, in month one, uh, and it was approved in month 24, and the grant was over. So um, that's an extreme case, but you wanted an example. I have to have two confessions here, too. <laughs> I, you know, I think it's important for people to know how delayed this stuff is getting. No, it, it's very delayed. I mean, actually, the first project that I did with the New Jersey data, uh, I guess the Easy Pass project, I had made an agreement that the office was going to do the linking. And so what I needed was uh, for birth records for each mother to be linked together so that I could follow the same mother over time. So they said, yes, we'll do that. And it, I waited for two years and it was never done. And so I, you know, finally I was able to have a conversation with somebody where I said, look, you know, I understand you wanna help and that you could do this, but it's kind of clear that you're not going to do it. So could I send somebody to do it? And so we had it discussion and got that person authorized and so on and so forth and so so that person That's went great. and did it. So it, 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 it can be done. Yeah, it can be done, but it, it you have to be patient. So first of all, I you guys should just note that this was the date, the last date that Mario Dowd ever spoke at the Woodrow Wilson School. That was a joke. And, <laughs> and um, I just want to wrap up by um, asking my panelists um, share one sort of charge or wish with the audience to um, liberate the data and uh, help you help them in New Jersey and help their patients and, and neighbors. I never want to have world-class researchers at world-class institutions have amazing grants that they worked hard to write, have to wait two years for simple routine data sets. So what's the charge? What do they do about that? We're going to have to write legislation. I don't see this happening any other way. You need hearings. You need the legislature to bang their fist on the table and say, this is unacceptable in the state of New Jersey. And then they need to tell the executive branch and have funded appropriately and staff it appropriately. Like, we should be outraged as citizens of New Jersey. This is, this is why we have a political process. Okay, so my wish is more modest, and <laughs> maybe the commissioner could do this all by herself and just say to one branch of the department that they need to sh cooperate with other branches of the department to share data so that it would be easier to link, say, hospital discharge, Medicaid claims, birth records, mortality. So and cooperation within state government. Well, yeah, I think Jeff's is easier than yours. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, findings out uh, in a timely way, in a, in a way that translates into English and not, not uh, statistic ease. So anyway, that, that, that's one thing I think we need to come to the table with. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Introducing my boss and the president and CEO of the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute, um, a friend and I think known to all of you, David Nolan. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, those of you who know Linda know she's being very kind to call me her boss. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to start. I only have a few comments to make, and we. Thanks to the gracious uh, uh, hosting of uh, Princeton, uh, the Woodrow Wilson School, we were able to accommodate our reception a little bit earlier, so I'm sure nobody will object to that. Um, I had a few comments to make, but before I did, I, I want to add my thank yous to the people that were here, not only the presenters who were just dynamite, but to the audience. I mean, this was a, quite an event. And uh, not everybody could stay for the whole thing, but if you, if you could see the list of who was here today, it's impressive. And the people who participated today are impressive. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson School, you guys have been great. Uh, they are wonderful partners for us. Uh, and I am so excited about that. I want to, I know everybody said it, but I want to add more thanks to the Nicholson Foundation, and special thanks to Joan for, for the work not only with events like this, but more importantly with the outreach that, the, that your health efforts with Maureen and Rachel and the rest of your team and Raquel have done to try to really affect change in our state. Foundations often fund things and kind of back off and take their hands off and, and this group doesn't. Uh, it's been awesome. And finally, I want to uh, add a special thanks to one of my board members, Heather Howard, and uh, uh, Linda Schwimmer, my vice president, and Jeff Brown, who heads our ACO effort. Um, I said, I don't know about big data. You know, uh, I don't know if that's going to be any good. And it was uh, their tenacity who said, we are doing this conference. That's why I, sh I say Linda lets me think I run the institute. I don't. Uh, so, so let me tell you one other thing before I make my closing remark. Uh, the reception is part of the gig, you know. You come to these things and you go to the reception and then you noodle through what you've heard all day. So please, everybody, don't just race out the door, but spend some time talking to each other. Go up consciously and talk to someone you haven't talked to before. Uh, one of the things that makes a partnership with Nicholson and with uh, Princeton, the Woodrow Wilson School, so great is that it creates that magic that happens when bright people get together. And so uh, don't lose sight of that when you take a break. Hear this. Upon this gifted age, in its dark hour, falls from the sky a meteoric shower of facts. They lie unquestioned, uncombined. Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun but there exists no loom to weave it into fabric. 75 years ago, 1939, Edna St. Vincent Millay wrote this poem. It seems especially poignant to me today for the issues that we're considering. Her description is cautionary. We've seen today that we can access incredible amounts of data. We can massage it, distill it, integrate it, correlate it, graph it, get pretty pictures of it, uh, connect those pictures with lines that you don't even know where they're going. Our challenge, however, is not the generation of data and charts, but instead the application of context to that data to turn it into useful, organized, structured information that accomplishes something, that fulfills a purpose. We've had quality data in healthcare for a long time. The Healthcare Pair Coalition, that was the parent to the uh, um, Quality Institute, uh, 22 years ago, published healthcare quality data of hospitals publicly in the press. It's the first time it was ever done. 
Nobody had ever seen quality data on Hudson. That was 22 years ago. There was very little traction. Uh, since that time, we've gathered quality data in a variety of different ways. Some at the state level, some at the federal level. It was esoteric. It was not very understandable. It certainly wasn't consumer relevant. Consumers didn't get it. Um, and it demonstrated very little variation. Uh, I think less than 1% of hospitals vary from the mean, which kind of belies any statistics I ever learned. But that's true. Very little effect on consumer choice or consumer behavior. Then two years ago, in the spring of 2012, the LeapFrog Group released the hospital safety score. A panel of experts organized the data into a transparent, consumer relevant, and unbiased data set that showed real variation. A, B, C, D, F is variation. Suddenly, consumers had something that was understandable and actionable which was delivered on the information highway and with a mobile app that you could look up what the rating of the hospital was near you, based on where you were living. Change started to occur. When we rolled this out, we were getting 700 hits a minute. Google shut down. They thought it was somebody attacking our, attacking our data set. Change started to occur. Today, hospitals are striving to get an A and bragging. You can see the billboards bragging when they do. Well, we're not stopping, at least at the Quality Institute, we're not stopping here. We are convening a group, and I always like it one of these things to give you a little sneak peek. We are convening a group, we have convened a group, of policy, safety, and clinical experts to identify specific elements of the administrative data set to predict surgical quality. So we'll be rating surgeons. We hope to be able to publicly report a performance score for New Jersey surgeons on a number of common surgical procedures with the intention of driving consumer choice, and we'd like to complete a pilot of this this year. So you're going to be hearing more about that. Some of you will probably want to be involved with us in that effort. My point is that it's not enough to have big data. It's not even enough to have insights from correlations of big data. Our new tools are awesome, but they're just tools. We need to place these tools in the hands of enlightened craftsmen, guided by creative data architects and sophisticated data engineers, so we can redesign our healthcare delivery system and craft better outcomes. It will not be the design of software or new sophisticated data analytics or graphs that will ultimately get us there. It will be groups of people sitting around flip charts and thinking through where we want to get and then using the data and the conclusions we can draw from it as a means of getting there. Folks like us, everybody in this room, asking if data we generate enhances our understanding in a way that's meaningful, in a way that matters, and that will ultimately produce better decisions and more responsible outcome. I think Linda alluded to it when she was up here. The secret sauce here is leadership. That's the secret sauce. There's no question that we have here today some of the best minds in healthcare, not only as presenters, but out in the audience, and some of the most talented folks in data management and data understanding. These data sets, data tools, and data delivery systems we have discussed today are certainly wonderful assets, but they pale in comparison to the leadership of the folks like you who will have to drive where we need to go with those data sets. Only with such policy leadership can we weave the big data that seems to fall from the sky as a meteoric shower of facts into wisdom that will leach us of our ill. Now that's transformational. Come join us for a drink.